Hi everybody and welcome to Eye Contact, a video news program on issues and controversies in ophthalmology sponsored by EuroTimes. I'm Dr. David Granite. Today we'll be talking about nystagmus with Dr. Richard Hurdle, who's a professor of ophthalmology from Ohio State. We're reporting right here from London and the subspecialty day of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus that's being held from the 32nd Congress of the ESCRS. Thanks for joining us, Rich. Sure, Dave. Great to be here. Now, your, your work in science has been really specific in nystagmus, and you've done 20 plus years in this topic. Have things really changed that much in nystagmus, or are there still some basics that people need to know? Well, I think that the biggest thing that's changed is our root, more routine evaluation of it using electrophysiological techniques. So we've taken the science and put it into the clinic so we can do clinical science with it and look at the disease itself. And out of that has come an understanding of the differences between the subtypes of nystagmus. Do those matter, the different subtypes? Absolutely. I think, in, especially in clinical medicine, everything hinges on the diagnosis. The whole understanding of why something is wrong, the physiology of the disturbance, where it's located in the body, and how we treat it depends on how we organize it and classify it. At the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus meetings, you actually laid out different approaches to different types of problems that children have. Can you help take us through some of the different approaches? Because really what we're talking about is most of the people in nystagmus have strabismus, a head posture, right. uh, or something along those lines, and there's surgical interventions that make a difference. Sure. So I think that we do have a blanket of treatment for patients with nystagmus, specifically the infantile form, which is the most common form. When people mostly think of nystagmus, they think of acquired forms of nystagmus associated with vestibular disease or uh, Meniere's with vertigo or disease of the brain and brainstem. But actually the most common type is one in infancy and childhood, many times associated with other eye problems. And right now, there's actually a paradigm of using medical, optical, and surgical treatments to improve the visual system in its entirety in patients with infantile nystagmus, not just the oscillation itself. So improving something like as simple as a refractive error can make an enormous difference for a child with nystagmus. Huge. We take it for granted, especially in this high-tech age of ophthalmology in the adult world, that that's routine. But many, many times I've seen patients with uncorrected high refractive errors, oblique astigmatic cylinder, especially the patients with albinism. That population is, was largely undercorrected. So on top of the nystagmus and underdevelopment of the optic nerve and retina, they're not even getting an optically clear image to the brain, causing immediate deficits in acuity as well as refractive types of amblyopia. Surgery to move a head posture, for example, when a child's turning, has been around for 50 or 60 years. But there's something that you've been working on that shows that not only when you move the head does, does that change, but the nystagmus characteristics change themselves. Can you speak to that and the importance to the child of the changing and slowing down of the waveform? So what we found out, and really this, this was first noticed by the father of nystagmus surgery, uh, R.J. Anderson, who is in Melbourne, Australia. He noted in 1959 that patients who have been operated on for an anomalous head posture with nystagmus had improvements in their visual acuity and improvements in the nystagmus. And over the course of the last 25 to 30 years, our group in collaboration with uh, other groups around the country have shown in animal models by operating on the eye muscles, we're actually effectively changing how the brain communicates to the eye muscles and favorably improving the beat-to-beat -beat nystagmus. What this does is it allows the brain more time to see the world, for lack of a better word, during each beat of nystagmus. And that improves visual recognition time, the uh, gaze-dependent visual acuity, so when we look to the sides, the world looks the same. We take that for granted, you and I, but in patients with nystagmus, that's not the case. They have a cone of vision that is around their eccentric or primary position No, And this widens that cone to better vision for a wider area. And I, I, the idea that they can recognize things quicker becomes so important in a normal day-to-day -day life. Yeah, we take it for granted. Um, the ability of rec fast recognition time as well as motion perception are the two things that are affected the most in infantile nystagmus patients. So the image that I, I give to families and parents is of a child in a moving car. 
The world is moving and the child is moving. These, these infants and toddlers don't even want to pay attention to the environment outside the car because they, it's too fast, they can't recognize it, as opposed to a vista, say, in the great American Southwest, where they can look at mountains which are not relatively moving as fast. But after we treat their nystagmus and they're getting more time per second of the world, they actually now are attending to images outside the car as it's moving. In the future, where do you see nystagmus treatment going? I think that once we understand the brain physiology a little bit more, we'll be able to treat these medically. We are actually working on topical medications that work on the same areas we're operating on that send messages back to the brain to slow the nystagmus down. You mean a drop? A drop, yeah. And you would be able to change the input and slow the nystagmus down without surgery just by using a drop? Yes, we actually have a... A paper in press using a typical glaucoma drop called azop or brinzolamide, which I have no interest in, but it, uh, it seems to work at improving the nystagmus. And we have an experimental drop and investigational medication, which we're starting human trials with it during the uh, end of this year. Amazing. So I want, want to wrap up with you talking about a child whose life has changed. What is the impact that we as ophthalmologists make on their day-to-day -day life? I think that the, the impact that I've heard from the families, and this is in the process of developing a, a questionnaire on this, is the, in their everyday life, it's the three things that matter to them most are their, their educational environment, their athletic environment, and their social environment. And we've seemed to make an impact in all three areas of their life by improving their nystagmus. So the ophthalmologist today has the opportunity to make a real difference in the life of a child with nystagmus. Yes. Terrific. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and for taking a few minutes here at the ESCRS Congress and part of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus to chat with us. Thanks, Dave. I've been talking to Dr. Richard Hurdle about nystagmus here on Eye Contact. For more information about this topic or any of the topics you've seen on Eye Contact, please go to eurotimes.org.